Thank you, Matt. Um, and thanks for coming this morning as well. Uh, I just wanted to give this lecture as... Uh, sorry, I'm just going to turn myself on. There we go. Let's start again. Um, I wanted to give this lecture purely because screening has been the topic and, uh, and there's also been a lot of controversy recently around the use of screening and how useful it actually is for practitioners. But as with any tool, it's likely more the way that it's applied and how the information is used that actually will dictate its usefulness. So essentially what we're going to talk about today is going to be centered around that and as Matt said, in elite male youth soccer players. Now, as, uh, as, as Matt said, I, I did have a history as, as, a, as, as a young football player and obviously my goal was to become a professional soccer player. And chatting to Athol Thompson yesterday, he actually said, well, this lecture is going out on YouTube, so uh, there's no room for any lies. So uh, just, just to prove it for Athol, here's me as I transition through uh, my journey as a, as a young soccer player. Had a very short stint at Brentford, as you can see on the left-hand side, and then spent uh, around six years at, at Chelsea under a number of different managers and, and learned a lot there. And then finished my career at the tentative age of 19 um, at Fulham. And, and you can see I was obviously a fine standing athlete by this picture here. I think uh, I probably also weighed about 20 kilos. So uh, hopefully I've improved a little bit from there. Um, unfortunately, during that time, and particularly when I was at Fulham, I had a number of injuries. So uh, that has obviously brought me to, to this research focus. And it's definitely an area that I'm passionate about and really want to try and uh, help young players where perhaps I was uh, a little bit more unfortunate. So, where are we going to start with this? I'm a systems guy, and to determine the effectiveness of our interventions, we need to build a system. Now, this is really important because, and again, there's, there's lots of discussion on Twitter about the usefulness of certain screens, which we won't go into now. But for me, if we're going to devise a screen, the first point and the first thing we need to do is to complete a real thoughtful, clear needs analysis to determine the movement demands and the injury demands of the sport. From there, we can then obviously identify mechanisms of injury. We can then obviously design a test battery and assess our athletes. And then we can finally implement a training intervention and then retest to determine how effective our intervention is. OK, so that's going to be the basis of our discussion today. And we'll revisit this model multiple times throughout the lecture. So where do we start? The topic of today is based on UK players, and specifically elite male youth soccer players. So my first start point was to go to the literature. And what we found was that this was the only paper by Price et al. It was published in 2004, but the actual data set was from 99 to 2001. My, another claim to fame is I was obviously one of these injured players in this data set, and I probably appeared quite a lot in his data set, which is unfortunate for me. And they found nothing unremarkable, predominance of lower limb injuries, um, most common injury was a thigh injury split between hamstrings and quadriceps and then knee and ankle injuries are also highly prevalent. So nothing too, uh, too remarkable there. You'd probably expect that if, if you've watched or played soccer yourself. However, the thing to consider is that that paper was published in 2004 and as I said, the data collection finished in 2001. But actually since then, there's been the emergence of, of what's called the Elite Player Performance Pathway or the Elite Player Performance Plan or the EPPP as it's more affectionately known. And since then, there's no published data in these players to determine the injury patterns, the injury incidents, and the injury prevalence. Now, again, you could probably say, well, so what? But I'll get into this later on, but there was actually a significant uh, difference in terms of the regulations imposed on clubs in terms of the number of contact hours that these players are actually required to fulfill their category status as a professional academy soccer club. So. What do we see then? If we, if we just look at the graph here, all this is tracking is the player incidence. So this is the incidence rate per player per season. And we can see there's a bit of variation, but there's generally a linear trend where the injury incidence would increase from your youngest players in this cohort, U11s, through to your oldest players, your U18s. So there's a somewhat linear increase in incidence with age. And we can see that in the older group, we're getting up to somewhere between 2.4 injuries per player per season. Now again, that's not going to be expected. That's that's not unexpected. Higher demands of match play, increased frequency of contact in terms of the number of sessions and number of matches. And the, these guys, the U18s, are probably more representative of young professionals because they'll be in a full-time program. To put these numbers in a bit of context, the line that I've just plotted on here is actually taken from the Price study, and that was the average incidence for the whole cohort: 0.4 injuries per player per season. Okay, and we can see that on the age group level, there's some variation, and we float above that line pretty regularly. 
The second line that I've just plotted on here, this is actually from our data set from that um, Journal of Sports Science paper I just showed you. And we can see that the injury rate has gone up to 1.34 injuries per season. So that's indicating that since the change in regulation, injury rates have somewhat tripled. So this is definitely something that we need to be considerate of. Now, while the last slide showed that the U18s potentially were our primary focus because they had the highest incidence rate, that might actually be a little bit misleading. When we actually look at the days lost through injury, so those injuries that would be classified as more severe, what we can actually see is it was actually the U14s and the U15s that actually missed the most days per season due to the injuries. Now, obviously, those of you that work with youth athletes will know that particularly from the U13s, U14s, U15s, there's going to be a significant amount of growth and development that's going to occur during those points. Now, some of you may be familiar with the term peak height velocity, which would be our maximal accelerated growth spurt. Average maturing boy, that's going to occur around age 14. These guys, elite male youth soccer players, we would probably indicate that will occur a little bit earlier because there'll be a, a higher proportion of early maturers. But when we actually averaged out the data set, we saw that age at peak height velocity was around 14. And that's probably because of the fact there was just such a big sample. In addition to peak height uh, velocity, which I said is the maximal accelerated growth spurt, we also need to consider peak weight velocity, which is spoken about slightly less frequently. And what peak weight velocity is, is obviously a rapid increase in mass, which is going to come from lean tissue and an overall change in, in our uh, development structures. So obviously what you've got here is you've got a taller athlete and you've also then got a heavier athlete. And they're going through rapid periods of growth, so therefore this might change their movement mechanics and we'll get into some of the issues around growth and maturation and why it might be a risk factor slightly later on. So I mentioned earlier about the change in governance and as I said, the Premier League put in uh, the EPPP around circa 2011, I believe. And we published a critical review of it in, in the Journal of Sports Science. And the main reason for this was, if we can actually look at this table here, from age, the age groups from 5 to 11 years, we see that there's a linear increase in hours recommended from 4 to 8 hours per week. So that's 8 hours per week of formalized soccer practice. Now, I'm not talking about strength and conditioning, gymnastics moves, and whatever else these guys do. That was recommended for soccer practice only. We then move up to the uh, 12 to 16 year olds and we see that there's a recommendation for 12 to 16 hours per week. So if you think back to the graph earlier and we saw that there was a spike in incidence and there's a real rapid and variation in the growth and development during those periods, you're asking your young athletes to do potentially up to 15, 16 hours a week. Now for me, that's gonna be a bit of a problem. And then finally, we can see uh, the, the hours per week recommendation of 16 hours per week in the oldest age group. So what the EPPP has done then essentially is just drawn a, a straight line from our youngest age group all the way through to our oldest age group and assume that the process of maturation is linear. But again, any of you that have worked with youth athletes will know that this process is far from linear. There's huge variation in the development of systems and that will obviously be within the individual but also then across players. Interestingly as well, the, um, the EPPP, if you actually read the original document, is based on the 10,000 hours rule. Now, for me, the 10,000 hour rule definitely exists. Are you all familiar with it? We'll just bring up to speed for anybody that isn't. Essentially, it was suggested that it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert performer. Now, when the guy that published some of the original work has come out in an editorial and said, hang on a minute, guys, you've definitely misinterpreted my message here. There is no universal 10,000 hour rule. And I think my best quote on the subject is that the 10,000 hour rule definitely exists plus or minus 10,000 hours. So somewhere in there, we're gonna to get to uh, the, the crux of uh, the conversation. So we've had a look at what the potential risk and the actual, um, uh, the magnitude of the problem is we're dealing with. Let's now look at the second part of our system, which is gonna be our, our mechanisms of injury. Okay, so from the same injury audit, what we wanted to do was to have a look at the most common injuries to see if there's also been a change from the, the previous study by Price, which I mentioned before. And what we actually found, well, there was some slight differences. The knee actually became the most common injury, uh, accounting for around 20% of all injuries, and most of those were knee ligament injuries. Ankle was our second most common injury, and then our quad injuries were the most common muscle injury, and then there was a small amount of foot injuries, actually very few in terms of 5-6% hamstring and groin injuries, which was a little bit surprised about, particularly with the groin injuries. <coughs> 
What's also important to note is that 62% of these injuries were non-contact in their mechanism. Now, obviously, we're never going to fully prevent injuries, but for me, we've got a much better chance of preventing non-contact injuries than we have those that obviously occur due to player contact. So there's definitely something we need to work on here. Now, just coming back to some risk factors and, and some of the things that are going to be specific for a developmental athlete, we reviewed the literature and, and what we found was that there's actually a, a paucity of data in these guys, so particularly our male youth soccer players, and, and there's definitely very limited information in, in our elite players. So we categorized some general risk factors into these four areas. So previous injuries we know from multiple studies and also for, from Roll's lecture, he highlighted this as well, that previous injury is going to be very strongly associated. I won't say it predicts because I definitely won't say that. It's very strongly associated with a future injury. Okay? Now I've highlighted it in yellow purely because it is somewhat preventable. Now you could say, well, how can you prevent a previous injury once it's already happened? Well, in my mind, if we can try and reduce the risk of some of these injuries in the first place, or these needless injuries, potentially it is somewhat modifiable. Also, this just does obviously highlight the importance of doing an injury history during our screening approach, which sometimes might be missed. If we move on to fatigue, now what the data shows us is that there is more injuries that occur towards the end of the first half and again towards the end of the second half. Now, while that doesn't necessarily implicate a clear fatigue mechanism, we know that that's something that we should probably think about in our prevention and screening programs. But what we do know from the data is that neuromuscular control, movement patterning changes in response to fatigue. So those athletes that look fine in baseline when we screen them in a non-fatigue state and that break down substantially under conditions of fatigue, that's probably something I want to have a look at. And the reason I put it here as well is because we know that children respond slightly differently in terms of fatigue. So we know that our youth athletes, particularly the younger guys, our prepubertal guys, actually are more... Um, attributable to central mechanisms of fatigue, so we definitely need to consider that with our youth athletes. Growth and maturation I've put in red because obviously it's a non-modifiable risk factor. I can't or I definitely shouldn't change how an athlete grows, okay? But it's definitely something we need to consider. So for those of you familiar with some growth and maturation physiology, what we know is that the stimulus for growth will come from the bone first, so you'll get a change in bone length. That will then obviously lead the muscle to grow in length, and then finally you'll get a change in cross-sectional area. But again, that process is non-linear and there's a bit of a developmental lag in those processes to take place. So what you might actually end up with, particularly in some of those periods of rapid growth that we spoke about before, you've got an athlete with a higher center of mass because they've got taller, and then potentially that you're gonna add weight on top of that as well. So it's kind of like giving somebody a new car and saying, look, this is really cool, and give them a Ferrari, but essentially you haven't given them any lessons to know how to drive it properly. And I know there's been some, uh, some times where you can even do that with professional football players. And at Chelsea, we saw two incidents with guys with Ferraris crashed into a lamppost outside the training ground trying to uh, show off in front of the fans. So definitely that's something we need to consider. And I've highlighted neuromuscular control. So don't be offended by the term neuromuscular control. I appreciate it's very nonspecific. Here I just mean general movement control, movement skill. But I've highlighted it in green just to say that this is probably our most modifiable risk factor and essentially why we decided to base our screening approach around this. Okay, so specifically delving into neuromuscular risk factors for knee and ankle injuries, because obviously those are our most common injuries that we identified from the injury audit. Again, we reviewed the literature in this paper in sports medicine and we actually found that there's actually very little there. So we had to make inferences from female data, from adult data. And obviously that's a slightly flawed approach, but we didn't have anywhere to start. So we needed to use that and try and examine some of these processes in our elite male youth soccer players. Similarly, we looked at all of the tests that potentially could screen these risk factors. And again, same thing, a high proportion of literature in female athletes and adult male athletes. So again, we had to devise our best guess at this point. And our process throughout this was to try and refine that approach and actually determine which tests had high clinical utility in elite male youth soccer players. So, what we ended up with, or what I proposed, was a developmental hierarchical risk factor model. And I'll just talk you through each step by step now. So, on the top row, these are proposed risk factors for knee and ankle ligament injuries. On the second row, what we can see here 
are potential categories of assessments that can be used to assess each risk factor. And our bottom row is categories of exercises that by virtue of training these should improve the test score, which should then improve or reduce the risk factor. So this was the developmental process that we put in place. What I'm going to focus on today is predominantly these two rows here. And this is where our work is starting to focus now, but I'll talk about that later. OK, so we've established the injury risk. We've discussed the mechanisms. Now let's have a look at the design of the test battery and also, again, how we actually go about assessing these athletes. So here's an example of one of the tests that we use. We did a maximal single leg hop for distance, which I'm sure you're familiar with with some of the ACL literature, on one leg hopping as far as you can. And in this example here, we took a distance of 75% of their maximum hop distance and asked them to hop onto a force platform here. Now, I just want to make the point here as well, and you're probably thinking, well, I use force, force platforms. This reduces the utility for a lot of labs, a lot of uh, football clubs that don't have access to these, particularly some of the lower categories. We've got some of these force plates in our labs upstairs. These are actually 500 pounds or 500 euro equivalent now. So these are actually very, very accessible to a lot of athletes and they sample at 1,000 hertz. That will mean nothing to some of you, but those of you who are into testing and screening, that's w where we need to be at, 1,000 hertz sampling rate. So this, this is actually a very practical tool that we can use. So I won't be able to discuss all of the findings from our cross-sectional analyses. We've got about six or seven papers in the literature if, if you want to go and find those yourselves. But in this paper, we looked at that test specifically and also the single leg hop for distance. And what we found was a couple of interesting trends. So if you look here, this is the horizontal hop distance, so the max hop distance on one leg, hopping as far as you can, sticking and holding the landing. And what we saw was that we saw a linear increase with age, as you can see. So the U11s and a general linear increase as you come up to the U18s. And you'd expect that because they get taller, they get stronger. When we actually look at the relative scores relative to leg length, because I can't really compare a U11 to a U18 unless I factor in stature, because it wouldn't be a fair comparison, we actually see that this pattern is much more variable. And of particular note is this data point here. And what we can see is the U13s. So we see that these don't change an awful lot, but then there's a reduction in the U13s followed by an increase in the U14s. And those of you that have read any developmental literature will know that there's a period of adolescent awkwardness that may occur in players around approximately 12 months prior to the peak, uh, prior to the growth spurt. So we hypothesized here that essentially changes in motor control and performance have occurred, which have then obviously subsequently reduced their hop distance. This is another sample test that we use, which is the tuck jump test originally proposed by Greg Meyer. And essentially what you do in this test is you just repeatedly hop up and down in a tuck jump manner for 10 seconds. Now he actually made that look pretty good, which is obviously why I've included him here. When you actually watch 500 guys of different stages of development do the test, it makes for some interesting viewing, and I've got an example of that later on. But what you're essentially looking at is what the foot does in terms of do they stagger their stance, do they land with their feet too close together, what the knees do, do they drive in into that valgus or knock knee position, do their thighs reach parallel in flight? So there's a number of factors that we can assess with this test. But what we did is because we wanted to make this a useful and um, very, very practical approach for coaches. So we tried to classify the knee position or the frontal plane control. And what we did is we used an ordinal scale of 0, 1, 2, or 3. And then we classified them as no frontal plane loss of control, which would be a 0, minor frontal plane loss of control, which would be a 1, moderate, which would be a 2, and then severe, which would be a 3. And how we did that is we used a frontal plane projection angle. So you draw an angle from the center of the hip to the center of the knee to the center of the foot. And we used angle classifications of 10 degrees. So 0 would be uh, no frontal plane deviation. From 0 to 10 degrees would be minor. From 10 to 20 would be moderate. And greater than 20 degrees of frontal plane displacement inwards would be indicative of a severe, um, a severe disruption in their frontal plane control. So the knee's really driving inside. And what we found was that the pre-adolescent, uh, pre uh, sorry, the pre-pubertal guys, they actually had the worst mechanics. And you can see here on the screen that they had the highest proportion 
of uh, grade two scores and grade three scores. When we actually reverse that and we look at the post-PHV guys, they had the best landing mechanics based on this test. So they had the highest number of zero scores and the highest number of one scores. Now, I haven't shown this data here, but linking back to um, that growth-related mechanism and that growth-related consideration, the U14s and the U15s also had asymmetrical scores. So they had a difference on the right versus the left. So again, that's probably telling us that these guys have got some form of disruption in their motor control, and it might be something that puts them at a greater risk of injury. This is another test that we use, and this is a single leg counter movement jump, for those of you that haven't seen this before. Again, performed on a force platform, but we also used um, 2D kinematics as well. So we looked specifically in the frontal plane, what the knee was doing, but also what the trunk was doing as well. Because we definitely want to have a look at not just the knee, we also want to consider the trunk and its effect potentially on the knee. And this was actually a little bit novel because if you look at the literature in terms of landing mechanics, what you normally see is that most people use bilateral tasks. Specifically, the drop jump is probably the most commonly used screening tool. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether that is or isn't a useful test. And it's pretty much been concluded that, that it isn't in terms of a screening modality, but probably a useful training tool. So what did the data show us? We split the group into pre-circa and post-PHV players. And as you'd expect, and similar to the tuck jump, if you take 180 degrees as being neutral alignment, as in no frontal plane loss of control, we can see that the post-PHV players, they had the best frontal plane control. And then if we come down to our pre-PHV players, they had the biggest loss of frontal plane control at the knee. So you're probably thinking, well, that's, that's nothing special. You just showed me that on the last slide. But that comes at a cost. So if we look at what the trunk was doing, we actually see the reverse. So the post-PHV players Although they had the um, most neutral alignment at the knee, as we can see here, they also had the highest lateral trunk flexion patterns as they were landing. And the likelihood of that is probably because they're jumping higher for a start, but also as well, remember I said their center of mass will be higher because they're taller. So it makes the task much more challenging. And the problem with that is, is what that will do is this pattern here will increase the knee abduction load because you take the ground reaction force vector lateral to the knee joint. So that's definitely something that we want to think about. And also maybe worth considering is that ankle injuries actually become more common in older players than they do in younger players. So we could maybe relate a mechanism there. Now, this is really important. As I said, we don't, don't just want to get sucked into just looking at the knee. So if we look at this athlete here, we can see that the knee is dropped in. So there's a bit of a loss of frontal plane control, but there's also some issues at the hip. So first question I want to know is, is that cause or effect? Okay, so the knee, I often call it a stupid joint. It essentially does what the hip or foot tells it to do. So is this loss of control coming from proximal factors, maybe the hip, or is it coming from a deviation in the foot? So that's something I probably want to have a think about. But also that trunk lateral motion is definitely important. And this was highlighted in this paper you can see on the uh, right-hand side of your screen by Bart Dingerden, and, and these guys did some excellent work. It's actually in females, but still we can take some things from it. And what they found was they used a similar single leg task, except it was a drop jump. And what they found was that it wasn't just the knee driving in into that valgus position that was the risk factor and was more strongly associated with injury. It was actually that combination of the knee driving in and the trunk moving laterally and when you put those two together, that was actually a higher association with injury. So it's definitely not just about the knee. We also need to look higher as well to see what the whole system is doing. So this uh, now brings me on to asymmetry, which I could probably do a whole lecture on asymmetry. And uh, one of my PhD students, Chris Bishop, is actually doing his whole PhD on asymmetry now. And I definitely recommend you read some of his work because he's doing some really good things there. Just to explain this graph for you, so how we expressed the difference between limbs was percentage of performance achieved. So we compared the highest performing limb to the lowest performing limb. So when you've maybe spoken about asymmetry, you probably think about 5%, 10%, and so on and so forth. Just think about this as 100% is perfect symmetry, and then we're looking for deviations from perfect symmetry here. So think downwards. So 85% would actually be 15%, if that makes sense. So... We did our 75% hop for distance landing on the force plate, as I showed you earlier. The single leg counter movement jump landing on the force plate. The single leg hop for distance. And we also did the anterior reach of a Y balance test, which if you haven't seen it, is essentially standing on a platform 
pushing our target reach indicator forward and then returning back to the platform under control. Now we use that reach direction only, there are other ones, but we use that one because that seems to have the strongest association with injury and previous data from uh, Plisky in 2006 showed that an asymmetrical reach of greater than four centimeters would increase your association or risk of injury. Now, there's a couple of things to take from this. The single leg counter movement jump landing force was the only variable that showed significant between group differences. And these emerged in the Circa PHV guys here and were consistent and remained in our post PHV players. So while we were only speculating, for me the single leg counter movement jump landing as you saw previously probably most closely represents the stance position of a, of a kicking action in soccer. And if you think about it, the majority of these players will be right footed. So therefore, we would expect that their control and balance strategies would be better on the left side. So that is something that we potentially propose. While we have no data to fully support this, this would, this would probably provide some uh, rationale as, as to why that occurred. Within the other tests, across groups, there was no significant interaction at all in terms of asymmetry. So this tells us that asymmetry is normal in this population. It's also normal in everyone sitting in this audience but it seems to be established early in childhood as well. So asymmetry in itself is probably not a key risk factor, it's probably more a change in asymmetry, which we'll get into later on. A couple of other things to think about as well is I've, I've plotted a line at 90%, or if you can flip it the other way, that would actually be 10% of asymmetry, or in this case, I've expressed it as 90% of symmetry. This 10% value has often been used as if you've got a value above this, you're not ready to return to sport, or if you've got a value above this, your risk of injury may potentially increase. Well, if we look at this, we can actually see that this doesn't really hold true because these guys were non-injured at the point of testing. Some of them obviously went on to get injured, so there's definitely something there. But we can see that there's huge variation depending on the test. So what we've started to propose, and, and this is coming out in, in some of Chris Bishop's work, as I mentioned before, is that I don't think we can say that 10% is a problem, 15% is a problem. Probably where we need to get to with our asymmetry classification is that asymmetry is task and variable dependent. Now I've done this with some of the ACL guys in, um, in the rehab hall downstairs and even within the same task, so a triple hop for distance in that case, what I saw was if I looked at the total distance covered, they had a limb symmetry index score of about 85% which is close to them being able to be discharged. But when I did some calculations of the contact time, the flight time, and used those and modeled the stiffness, so how much their center of mass displaces, and the force, particularly in the stiffness, I saw a difference between limbs of 45%. And that's in the same task. And I know Olivier Girard has shown that in sprinting, that in uh, the horizontal versus vertical force production asymmetries will be different. So I don't think there is one blanket threshold that we can put on every single test. So we probably need to think about task-specific asymmetries and maybe even variable-specific asymmetries. So in terms of determining our usefulness, we've used the data to identify cross-sectional trends and we've obviously established some norms. Now the big, the money question, can we use this screening to identify those that are at high risk? And that's where we're going to go next. So we looked at this uh, in a paper we've just recently published. It was actually fully published in the journal yesterday in the Scandinavian Journal of Science and Medicine in Sport. And what we did is we tracked 350 players. We screened them at baseline and we followed them throughout the season to determine who actually went on to get an injury using the battery of tests that I've just shown you here. And uh, what we found was that, all right, it's a, a bit of a messy table, but we'll just hone in on a few things here. Single leg counter movement jump landing force asymmetry was our most consistent risk factor. So we can see it appears here in the under 11s and under 12s and again at the under 15s and under 16s. Now this is the multivariate analyses. We also did some univariate analyses as well and it was pretty consistent across all of the, uh, all of the age groups that we used. Also, if we look at this one here, the single leg counter movement jump landing force relative to body weight on the right side and we actually saw something we didn't expect to see. Those with a stronger association with injury actually had lower relative landing forces on their right leg. So again, that was something we struggled to explain, but potentially we may think it be, if you think back to what I said earlier about that single leg counter movement jump most closely resembling 
um, the single leg stance for soccer players and obviously those that are right footed players will probably be more proficient on their left leg. That could maybe go some way towards explaining that. Also we saw that age was a fairly strong association in our older players but most interestingly in the U13-14 group the only variable associated with injury was maturational offset. So those that were further away from uh, achieving their peak growth spurt. And what I took from this is that during that period, because of that rapid growth that's occurring, to be able to identify those players that actually move differently is going to be very, very difficult because there's going to be such a variation in how they move. And that's probably going to be biggest in this one here. But just a few things, a few further points I just want you to take from this is Obviously, if you're screening an adult population, adult footballers, you can probably have a generic test battery that's applicable to all. Well, if you're using these guys, what we see is that the risk factors changed across growth and maturation. So probably we want to think about if we're going to have a generic battery, that's fine because it gives you some repeatable data and allows you to establish some norms. But maybe we want to consider weighting of risk factors depending on what stage you're at in their development. Another point is if you actually look at some of these odds ratios, they're pretty low. So while there are some associations there, we know that a lot of these tests are not going to give you too much information with regards to who's going to go on to get injured. But you didn't need me to tell you that. You already had Roll Bar that told you that. And uh, I definitely would support his notion on that. Okay, so why can't we predict injury then? Um, I borrowed this uh, video from Athol Thompson, so I have to give him credit. So here we can see Hamburg player, nice little bit of build-up action, nice little one-two, great cross into the box, back post, he's sneaked a goal in, great finish. But watch what happens next. Okay, you can't see it clearly here, but our replay will tell us. Does a nice little spin, takes off on our official turf, lands on grass, and gets tackled by the corner flag for good measure. <laughs> now, if you're telling me we could predict that and we could devise a screen that would be suitable to determine deficient movement patterns and that, you're a much better coach than me. Another example, difference in surface. Again, yes, maybe in our training we can start to play around with different surfaces. But again, are we, very, are we going to get anywhere near to being able to predict some of these things? We know that football is a very chaotic environment and there's going to be lots of factors that are going to contribute to an injury, but we're definitely not going to be able to predict these types of things. But maybe what I will propose is a bit of a paradigm shift. I'll start the video, so I'll stop you wincing. I'll go back. Um, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. So if we're not predicting injury with some of our screening tests, but I showed you there's some deficiencies, maybe we're actually identifying poor performance. So whether their knee dives in or their trunk goes this way or their landing force is really high, while I won't be able to say to that individual, well, with any certainty that you're actually going to go on and get injured, I can say that you've got a performance leak there. Okay? There's a breakdown somewhere in your kinetic chain that we need to maybe try and work on because, all right, if it doesn't necessarily predict your risk of injury, it will definitely reduce your performance and over time might have a contributing factor to a potentially another injury. So... If we're not using injury risk screening to identify injury risk, we can definitely use it to identify previous deficits. Now, here you can see probably one of the greatest athletes in the world um, performing a counter-movement jump. This is actually upstairs in the lab, and here you can see a dual force plate system. So I've actually got my left foot on one force plate and my right foot on another force plate. And what you end up with is a force time curve. Now, don't be worried by this. If you've never seen a force time curve, I'm going to talk you through it. So here we can see this is the athlete standing still. This is the loading phase and the propulsion phase of the first jump. And this is the landing. Okay? And what you're seeing here is a comparison of the orange, which is the right leg, versus the left leg. So th you can probably see from that there's some pretty clear deficiencies. But we can actually break this curve down a little bit further. And this is what um, some work that I'm involved with, led by Luke Hart, we're actually doing at the moment. And we uh, classified players as those with a previous severe injury versus those with no history of a severe injury within the last 12 months. And we got them to do this task. And what you can see is here, there's no real, there's a few deficiencies in terms of standing, but I wouldn't be too worried about these. 
Here, the athlete has started to unweight to squat down during the jump. And from this point here to here, this is then breaking to stop their center of mass from moving downwards. Because obviously, the goal of the task is to jump back up in the air. And even this point here, from here to here, is the real rapid deceleration component of braking. And this will give us our force at zero velocity. So it's called that because the center of mass has stopped moving downwards. OK, so the velocity is zero. And what we found was that there was very strong effect sizes, as you can see here, between those that had a previous injury and those that didn't. So this test was able to readily identify those that had been returned to play safely and were currently playing, but had had a previous injury. This portion here is the concentric portion, then driving back up in the air. And again, we can see that there's very, very strong effect sizes. So I've used this graph as an example because this one's really bad. But obviously, some of these, they won't all look this bad. For me, what you can actually see is that they've effectively performed a two-legged task here on one leg because you can see the asymmetry difference between the two limbs here. Also, if we have a look at the landing force, there's a th over a 1,000 newtons difference in a two-legged landing task. So they've essentially landed like that on one side. Okay, that's an exaggerated pattern, but they've really loaded over to that side. So you can use this information, and then, again, it's just information. It's nothing without your interpretation. You've got a decision to make. Would you let your athlete return to play in this position? This ath these athletes did return to play, but they had, didn't have this information when they let them return to play. So maybe we can use these screening approaches to say, OK, well, maybe we need to hold you back a little bit here. Maybe there's some targeted interventions that we can do to try and reduce some of these factors. OK, so we're now on to training interventions. Now, unfortunately, I don't have too much for you on this point. This is where our work is going next, but it's the final layer of our model. There's actually very little literature in male youth soccer players to, to, to actually say, well, these interventions are effective. But what we wanted to do was to not just come up with something. We wanted to engage with the practitioners. So this is a recent paper that we published, and what we actually did is we asked the practitioners their current perceptions and what they did in practice. And I'll talk through some of the data in a minute, but something that was really interesting to me was that only 4.3% of the coaches we surveyed used recommended programs like the FIFA 11 Plus. And in discussion with them, they seem to deem that it's not appropriate for elite athletes. It's probably more designed to recreational populations. Now, I'm not here to say it's good or bad. We can maybe discuss that afterwards. But it's definitely something we want to consider that the intended audience or potentially youth soccer players, because there's a FIFA 11 Plus kids version now as well, is not being used in the field. So some things to consider when we're actually designing our training programs is what the barriers are to implementation, because a good training program is only good if it's actually done. Otherwise, it's, it's just a training program. And the biggest, so unrealistic staff to player ratio was definitely a factor, but the biggest area was time available. And um, I haven't got the data to show you here, but it seemed to see that once or twice a week in a warm-up is often the most devoted time to injury prevention specific training. OK, specific injury prevention components. And you can see that here. So it's delivered for a combination of independent and warm-up sessions, but also a high frequency of actual warm-up sessions. So what do we do with that information? Because it's been suggested, and I'm not saying I fully disagree with it, but I probably question it a little bit in terms of how it actually works practically in the field. It's been suggested that we should just give the same intervention to everybody. Well, possibly we could do that. But we can also have a look at some of the literature and this is a paper from Tim Hewitt's group. And what they found was they risk stratified their players or their athletes. So what they did is they used a drop vertical jump task and then they put them into high and low risk based on their knee abduction moment. Whether that's a good or bad approach in terms of the knee abduction moment and it predicting risk or not is a different question. But what they did find was that, that those with the high knee abduction moments were actually more responsive to training. And there was no change in the group that had lower knee abduction moments. So why would we want to train everybody the same way if they're not deficient in some of those risk factors? This is also shown by Greg Meyer as well uh, from 2007, and he showed the same thing, 13% reduction in those that were classified as high risk, no change in the group that, weren't, that were classified as low risk. Okay, So when you've got multiple mechanisms, multiple injuries, it's all right if you've just got, if there's only one injury that ever occurs in that sport, say a hamstring injury. But what if hamstring injuries are common? What if knee injuries are common? What if ankle injuries are common? What if groin injuries are common? 
For me, maybe the strategy is there's a bit of generic stuff that everybody gets, and then maybe the last 15 or 10 minutes of that warm-up can be stratified and put them in groups and say, well, you guys are doing some ankle prevention stuff, you guys are doing some knee stuff, you guys are doing some hamstring stuff. So they all get a bit of everything, but then they get top-ups based on where they're deficient. So coming to the end now, this is my opportunity to have a little rant about some of the limitations in some of the current screening approaches. So we won't spend too long on it, but we'll, we'll just go through a few things. So um, I could have put any number of movement screens up here. So this is not necessarily a direct dig at this particular paper, but it was a soccer injury movement screen, so I decided to put this up. Now what this screen looks like, there's a series of tests, test one, test two, test three, test four, test five, and you've probably seen some of these movements before. Now due to time, I'm just going to talk about this one, and this is that tuck jump assessment that I showed you earlier. So they repeatedly did tuck jumps for 10 seconds. And what they did in this test, and they've actually used this now to determine its, its ability to predict risk. It's actually in press at the moment. And what they did is they looked at the total score, but it bemused me a little bit because we'd already published on this in 2016, a year before the paper came out. And what we showed was that of all the criteria that you can see here that are used in the tuck jump assessment, the only variable that was actually repeatable in a test-retest fashion was knee valgus. So we questioned the utility of using that approach with all of the risk factors and the total score because it's going to change from session one to session two just due to normal movement variability. So how do you really know if you're correct in deficient risk factors? So maybe when we're actually planning our screening programs, we want to think about what the data is already telling us. And definitely re reliability and repeatability is something we want to think about. We did it again with common force platform measures, and I showed you the test that we used, the hop and stick onto the force plate and the single leg counter movement jump. And this is a single leg counter movement jump force trace. So if that's the point of ground contact here, we looked at the peak force, so just this value up here, which was pretty reliable. But we also looked at the time to peak force, so the time from ground contact to peak, and we saw a coefficient of variation of 33%. We also looked at the time to stabilization, which is the point from ground contact to the point where they achieve a st stable state, which is based on a percentage of their static body weight. It's coefficient of variation of 39%. Now, this isn't a stats lecture, but what we can interpret this is, is that if you're going to train your athletes, you need to know in this situation that they got better by more than 39% for it to actually be a true difference. Otherwise, it's just potentially measurement error. Now, again, you guys might be better coaches than me, but you've got to make some pretty significant changes to get 40% differences in a short time frame. Okay, so here we've got a drop jump again on the left side, and here we've got a tuck jump, same player. A little time for him to do his hair. Okay, watch him performing the task. Okay, look back to this one. Just look back at this one again quickly when it displays. Doesn't look too bad, I wouldn't be too worried about that. This is the same landing point from the two different tasks. Drop jump, tuck jump. We can see some pretty obvious differences in terms of their knee control. I wanted to quantify that. Five degrees five degree loss of frontal plane control, so if 180 is neutral, 15 degrees in the tuck jump. Interestingly, this player went on to rupture his ACL. This was baseline screening. So the point I'm trying to make is, don't necessarily use all of the information, consider what constraints the task is putting on this athlete. Here they drop from a 30 centimeter box. This is a U18 soccer player, a professional academy Premier League soccer club. He can jump higher than 30 centimeters. So if you really want to assess the landing mechanics, we need to challenge this system a little bit. Because we can see what happened when I gave him a more open, reactive, perturbated task and I challenged his jump height a little bit, his mechanics started to break down. So maybe we want to think about individualizing the screening process to try and challenge some of these thresholds a little bit. So you probably ask me then, all right, Paul, clever clogs, how high should kids drop, uh, drop from? What about this? I think what's most worrying is the parents' reaction at the end there. Like, now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that you should get your kids dropping from this height. The point I'm trying to make is we maybe want to think about, you know, kids are actually capable of some pretty impressive things. This is probably a step too far. 
but definitely you want to think about challenging that neuromuscular system. Okay, a couple of final points. I spoke earlier about the importance of maybe moving to a monitoring system. So instead of screening where we just take a singular snapshot and then wait for injuries to happen or to not happen across the season, well, why don't we repeat some of these measurements? You can't do it for all of them, but here what we can do is we can track maybe once a month for some measures, maybe weekly, depending on what it is. We can actually track their movement footprint over time. Again, if you plot hypothetical thresholds or maybe if we develop our own specific thresholds, we can actually see where they move in and out of these thresholds and maybe we can identify patterns where for this particular athlete, if they move above this certain range, they're more likely to get injured, they're more likely to break down. This is important because, again, I've mentioned Chris Bishop earlier. This is taken from a recent systematic review that we did. It's the same thing in performance. You can't predict those that are going to be slower, weaker, or jump higher from a one snapshot of an asymmetry test. Okay, there's very, very little association. So it's probably if I start at 10% and I move to 15% or 20%, does that have an effect on performance? Does that have an effect on injury risk? Maybe that's something we want to have a think about. Also, I won't get into electron fatigue because we'll be here all day again, but all of the screening that we generally do is done in a baseline state. And I said at the beginning, there may or may not be a fatigue-related mechanism to some of these injuries. So not for all of our tests, but for some of our tests, we maybe want to think about constraining the athlete, constraining the human, constraining the organism by putting them in a condition of fatigue, whether that's a repeated sprint protocol, a match, a simulated soccer pro, whatever it may be, and then we can see, well, if you're good in baseline, how well do you stand up when you're in a condition of fatigue? Do your mechanics break down? Now, we're collecting some data on this now, and what you'll actually see is on the group level, it won't tell you anything. So we saw changes of around 3 to 4%, but the standard deviation was 15%. So there's very highly variable strategies used, but we're probably looking for those that break down considerably, and it might be one or two athletes within our group that we say, okay, cool. Well, either we need to train you under conditions of fatigue, or we need to develop your robustness, your aerobic capacity, and your strength so you can deal with the demands of match play much more effectively. And then finally, and I'm doing a lecture on this at the Asian Football Conference, what we do and say matters, and I think we underestimate how important that is. So in this paper, we presented the, the technical model for a drop jump, but we also just wanted to show coaches how important it is what you actually say. So if you look at this, this is the same task, dropping off a box, the only difference is the instructions. So in the top row, the only different thing is we didn't tell them how long to spend on the ground. We pretty much said you can spend as long as you want, just jump as high as you can. In the bottom task, we said you must minimize your ground contact. Okay, so as soon as you hit the floor, jump up high as quick as you can. And what you see is there's a big difference in the center of mass displacement. There's higher vertical ground reaction forces in this one and you'll get a greater uh, resultant vertical stiffness. Now, if I'm looking at stiffness as a measure, ground reaction force as a measure, knee flexion as a measure to determine injury risk or whether their landing mechanics are good or bad, well, this athlete can do whatever I ask him to do. It just depends on what I ask him to do and how I talk to him. So that's really important. We need to watch our language because if we're trying to promote certain outcomes and we're using this information to write training programs, I might have just given him a false training program that he didn't need. So it's really important to think about what we actually say. And obviously, that's, that's definitely something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about as well. So our take-homes then. Screening, for me, is a useful tool based on the provision that limitations are considered and it's used appropriately. So we're not trying to predict risk. But we are identifying defic deficient movement patterns potentially existing problems, and maybe in this case we can use it to identify sensitive times during growth and maturation. For me, I think risk stratification is an option. Again, it may or may not reduce actual risk, but it will definitely identify performance leaks, and we can start to target our training programs a little bit more closely based on the deficiencies that our athletes are going to show in front of us. And I think some of this future research into screening should probably consider longitudinal monitoring, effects of fatigue, and definitely cueing and challenging that neuromuscular system. Think back to what I said about that tuck jump versus the drop jump. Okay, are we pushing our athletes hard enough in screening to determine where they actually break down? And finally, most important message, screening by itself doesn't predict or prevent injury. It gives you information. The most important thing is what you do with that information.
Thank you.